Welcome to Concordia. Uh, this is week eight of our COVID-19 exile, and I am so happy that we have this technology that lets us be together for worship, even though we're far apart. You know, I wanted to also mention something to you. This week, the governor of Texas and the mayor of San Antonio issued new guidelines for this COVID-19 time. And the fact of the matter is it opens the possibility of in-person worship. But I also want to let you know that here at Concordia, we've decided we're going to move very slowly in that regard. We're not going to begin in-person worship just yet. We're going to continue to evaluate week by week. But there are two things in particular I want you to keep in mind. Number one, we want to have an opportunity for folks to begin to get acclimated to this social distancing before we begin in-person worship, and it's really more of a distraction than it is a blessing. But secondly, and most important of all, I am absolutely convinced that it is my responsibility to make sure that for those most vulnerable to this COVID-19 virus, that we're doing everything in our power to protect them, to keep them safe. Remember, I'm called to be the shepherd of this flock, to take care of and love our people. And so we're going to move slowly, but I also promise you, I can't wait until we can be together in our sanctuary for worship. I also want to mention something else to you with regard to worship style. If you've been worshiping with us online these last few weeks, we, you know that we've been using a style of worship that really is a blended service, elements of traditional services and contemporary services. Well, this week, if you're tuning in to our 8 o'clock service, it's going to be more traditional, like our normal in-person 8 o'clock service usually is. If you're tuning in to any of the other services, there'll be that blended service that you've grown accustomed to. Right now, Let's take a minute and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the blessing of this technology and for the privilege of worshiping you in your name. Lord, we come to you this day expecting and knowing that we will receive from your hand of grace and your mercy that overflows to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we gather for worship today, even while we're apart, we know that we have a loving God in whose name we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we can be very grateful for God's love because God's love is what takes us through times of trial, and God's love is what covers over our sin. And so we take a moment together now to confess our sins before God. I'd invite you to speak these words with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We take a moment of silence now to confess those sins that trouble us in our hearts. In Psalm 136, the psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his faithful love endures forever. You know, God's love is so faithful that it moved him to send his one and only son to die on a cross in our place for our sins. And because of that amazing love and that great work, I can assure you that your sins have been forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
you made all things work together for my good. Lord, you made all things work together for my good. You You know, God's word is absolutely timeless, and it deals with things that we deal with even today. Our reading for today is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is actually faced with a pandemic and all of the problems that it causes. This is from Jeremiah 16, beginning at verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place, for this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in this land and about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried, but they will be like dung lying on the ground. They'll perish by sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for birds and the wild animals. And do not enter a house where there is feasting and sit down to eat or drink. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Before your eyes and in your days, I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in this place. You know, that's tough stuff. And Jeremiah lived during a tough time. And yet, if you read the rest of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah also lived with hope, even during difficult moments. And you know what? During this difficult moment, we can live with hope too, because we have a God who will see us through. And so we confess our faith now in that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by using the words of an ancient creed of the church, the Apostles' Creed. Speak these words with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, here's a special message just for the kids from our Executive Director of Children's Ministry, Nicole Carmines. Hey, boys and girls. I'm so glad you can join us for our children's message. Today's scripture lesson is a little bit strange. It's about a prophet, a prophet named Jeremiah. Now, a prophet is a person who is called by God to speak for God. Well, this prophet, Jeremiah, he is living in a crazy, crazy time. Enemies are after him. He is so scared. Can you imagine? Enemies are after him? I bet that is scary. 
Can you show me your scared face? That is a scared face. Well, God says to Jeremiah, he's going to have to be alone, all alone. Jeremiah won't be able to get married. He won't be able to go to any parties. He won't even be able to go to any worship services. And that's kind of how you and I are living right now. I bet Jeremiah felt really, really lonely. Well, friends, what we can learn in this story, just like Jeremiah, in times of trouble, in times of sadness, and even in times of loneliness, we need to remember that God is good, God is faithful, and God is always with us. Can you say that with me? God is good. God is faithful. God is always with me. I have a really cool art activity I'd love to share with you. And it's really easy. It's something you can do at home. You would need a couple of sheets of paper, some crayons, some baby oil, and some tissue or a cotton ball. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to draw a self-portrait. Now, I had my really good friend, Mrs. Preston. She helped me out. And she helped me draw a picture of me. And then, my second piece of paper, I have a heart. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my picture and with, with some tissue paper, I'm going to dip it into oil and I'm going to paint the oil all over my picture. And when I hold up my picture over the heart, after I've painted it, something really cool happens. You can see the heart through the picture. That reminds me that Jesus can always see our hearts and he knows when we're lonely. Okay, let's pray. Let's bow our heads and fold our hands and you repeat after me. My turn, then your turn. My turn first. Dear God, Thank you for today. Thank you for Jesus. He's our Savior. And He's your Son. Help me to know that when I am lonely, you are with me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you real soon. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. We're delighted to have you streaming with us. You know, if you've been giving to Concordia's ministries, I want to say thank you. Your faithfulness allows us to do what we're able to do to bring the gospel, to bring the good news of Jesus to so many folks. Now, if you'd like to give today, there are several different ways you can do that. If you're streaming with us on your desktop or on your laptop, just click the button that says Give, and that'll take you straight to our giving page. Or you can go directly to our website, concordia.cc, or if you prefer, you can also give by mailing us a check to the address that's right there on your screen. Now, we're a congregation who is delighted to pray, and we'd be honored to pray for you or with you. If you have a prayer request, go to the website, concordia.cc slash prayer, and you can send us your prayer request there. Or we have prayer partners who are standing by right now. All you have to do to get a hold of them is call the number at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be happy to pray for you. Now, this time is tough, but it's also a blessing in a lot of ways because it allows us to be with people even though we're physically separate. And so we have a good friend at Concordia, Kip Fox. He's, a, he's an awesome songwriter, and he put together a song. He, he's in Arizona, but he's going to share it with us as part of Concordia's worship today. And so take a listen. I hope it's a blessing to you. I have seen still waters I have walked their shores in the midst of darkness in the fiercest storms 
Because you set a table before me and prepare a feast. You pour the wine in the presence of my enemies. In the Because you set a table before me and prepare a feast. You pour the wine in the presence of my enemy. Because you set a table before me and prepare a feast. You pour the wine in the presence of my enemies. You set a table before me and prepare a feast you pour the wine in the presence of my enemy you pour the wine in the presence of my We have the privilege as God's people of coming to him in prayer. And so we take some time to do that now. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the honor that we have of worshiping you. Thank you for all the gifts that you give to us, even during difficult times. We know that you have made us a promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. And so we thank you that you walk with us no matter what we face, be it today or tomorrow. Heavenly Father, during this service, we remember those who are sick. We ask you to be with them and restore them to health for all of those first responders, for all of those in the medical profession. Their jobs are monumental right now. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would make all of their efforts, whether it's treating this pandemic or treating others who are sick, fruitful and successful. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with our leaders, be with our president, be with all of those in governmental offices. Give them the wisdom that they need to make the good decisions that need to be made. Heavenly Father, we know that because of Jesus, we have hope for tomorrow. He is the one who has given us salvation. He is the one who will lead us to eternity. And so it's in his name that we pray, as together now we pray the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
So we're calling this series Attitude Adjustment. You know, it's like this. Uh, there are always those times in life where we are around somebody and for some reason they seem to have a chip on their shoulder. They seem to be frustrated or angry. They just sort of have an attitude problem. And you think to yourself, man, that guy needs an attitude adjustment. They need a, a different attitude. Or maybe it's yourself. You know, I find myself in this COVID-19 time of exile more frustrated, more on edge, having to really kind of talk myself into an attitude adjustment. During this time, we're focused on attitude, but it's not just any old attitude. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes these words, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. Wow. He's telling us that we need to have an attitude, and not just a good attitude, we need to have the attitude of Jesus. Now that's kind of hard. It's especially hard when, when we find ourselves brooding or worrying or struggling or, or feeling alone. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about loneliness because loneliness can be complicated and it can be painful. I mean, think about it. Loneliness can be physical. We've all been in a situation where we are literally the only person in a place, whether it's the only person living, living in a place or the only person working in a place or the only person who showed up for something. And when we're alone physically, we can feel lonely. But loneliness can also be something that occurs even when we're in a group of people. Loneliness can be emotional. For example, have you ever been in a situation where you have to make a really tough decision? You have a, a lot of pressure and a lot of implication and you feel the weight of the world and you may be surrounded by people. There may be people literally looking at you and waiting for you to make the decision, but you feel all alone. You feel lonely. So whether it is physical loneliness or whether it is emotional loneliness, the fact of the matter is loneliness is real and it can be very hard. In fact, it's interesting when we think about the way God created us, you and I were created to be in relationship. In fact, think about the, the very first comment that God makes about people and the need for relationship goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, all the way back to Adam. And God creates Adam. He puts him in this perfect garden, gives him the perfect job. Everything is absolutely the way God intends. And yet still, in Genesis 2, verse 18, God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. Even from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you and I were created to be in relationship. You know, there's a passage that I love in Proverbs chapter 17. In fact, it's an easy one to remember. Proverbs 17, verse 17, and it says this, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. So think about what it's saying to us. When do we need a friend? Well, a friend loves at all times. We need friends all the time. And what about that, that friend who is closer than just a friend, that brother? When do we need them? Well, we need them in times of adversity. Dear friends, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. It, during this COVID-19 time, we are all facing adversity. And the reality is that what makes this isolation that we have, the, the stay-at-home orders that so many are experiencing, what makes it so difficult is at the very time of adversity, when we need other people the most, we're being told, stay away from other people. That really gets to the heart of loneliness. And so today, to, to dig into this and to look for an attitude adjustment when it comes to feeling lonely, we're going to go to a man named Jeremiah. He's a prophet in the Old Testament. Now, Jeremiah is told to isolate himself, to quarantine, but not by government officials. Jeremiah is told to isolate by God, to stay completely away. And man, it's really tough. So Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Then the word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place. So for context, Jeremiah was a prophet, prophet in southern Israel, and he's a prophet in southern Israel when everything is falling apart. Things are terrible, and the kings, they're wicked, and they're weak. Everything's going wrong, and Jeremiah is the only voice. He is the singular voice for righteousness, the only one speaking out for God in the entire area. 
In Jeremiah chapter 16, God says to him, you must remain alone. You cannot marry. You cannot have a family. Think about that. By divine decree, that sounds really hard. And it sounds like a formula to be lonely. But you know, when you think about it, in the Bible, there are some other folks who were alone. For example, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a single man his entire life. He's also a guy who, in the midst of all of that, suffered and died. There's another guy who was alone, John the Baptist. Great, great leader, great witness for God, who never married and was alone. And he suffered and he died. Well, there are others, but one of the most notable is Jesus himself. While Jesus had disciples, Jesus never married. He was alone, and he suffered, and he died. Are you you beginning to see a pattern happening here? And what you need to understand is that pattern holds true for Jeremiah. So let's pick it up in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 3. For this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in this land and about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. So in other words, God is saying to Jeremiah, you need to understand what's going to be going on in this land. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. Now this is, this is a hard passage of Scripture. And it's even hard to hear this description, but I want you to not miss the point. God is telling Jeremiah that a part of the reason why he needs to remain alone, he needs to remain unmarried without children, is because there's going to be a pandemic sweeping across this land. And it's going to make COVID-19 look like child's play. People are going to be dying everywhere, all around. In fact, they're going to die in such droves that they won't even be buried. They'll be left where they fall. Talk about horrible and talk about hard. And God is telling Jeremiah in the midst of this hard, painful, horrible time, he must remain alone. Dear friends, I don't know how you're feeling in this particular moment, but I know that even though our pandemic is not quite like Jeremiah's, I know that this pandemic is difficult and it isolates us. And I know, even if you don't feel it right now, there are times where most of us feel lonely. And so I want to spend these next few moments talking about how you and I can navigate loneliness. I know you're going to be amazed. I've got three points. Are you ready? Point number one. When it comes to navigating loneliness, you and I have to reach out. We've got to reach out to other people. You know, one of the things that I love about Jeremiah is that as hard as his life is and as lonely as his life is, he doesn't pretend to be pious. He doesn't pretend to God or to anybody else like, oh, you know, it's okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm tough, I, I'm not worried about it. He lets God know exactly how he's feeling. So just a few examples. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19, Jeremiah says, I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. What's he saying? He's saying, God, you're killing me. You're leading me to the slaughter. This is terrible. Or in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, you are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? What's Jeremiah saying? He's saying, you know, God, I got this problem. You're supposed to be a God of justice, and yet life doesn't look and life doesn't feel very just. Or how about Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 18? Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that falls. Now think about that. Jeremiah is speaking to God. He's saying, you know what, God? I got to tell you something. I don't like the way you operate. In fact, it feels to me like maybe you've baited and switched me, like you you promised me one thing and now you're delivering something entirely different. Jeremiah is right out there. 
And his loneliness and his pain and his frustration, he doesn't pretend like it's not there. He reaches out to God and he tells him exactly the way it is. You know, that's so different from the way most of us operate. The way we operate toward God, the way we operate toward one another. We tend to have that pious, that false piety, and we try to pretend like we're strong. We try to be stoic. We try to act as if everything's fine. I can't tell you how many times in my ministry I've talked to people, and, and they're, they're single, and they're feeling lonely, and their friends have all gotten married, and maybe they're having kids, but they don't tell anybody. They don't talk to their friends because their friends have moved on in their life and they just don't, they don't even want to bother them anymore. Or how many times have I talked to a widow or widower and now maybe for the first time in decades they're all alone and their children well, their children aren't around much because their children are raising their children. Their children are trying to build their careers. And yet, instead of reaching out and saying, man, I am so lonely. Can you spare a little time for me? They, they act like they're tough and strong and everything's okay. Because their kids, you know, they're busy with their own life. Or even people who are struggling. People feel alone when they're, when they're struggling, when they're in pain, when they're dealing with hardship, when they're dealing with with. A, a real pain in their relationships or in their life. I mean, one of the, the horrible effects of the isolation that happens in COVID-19 is that domestic abuse has skyrocketed. And yet when we're facing things like domestic abuse or financial struggles or, or other kinds of problems, how often do you and I pretend like everything's fine? And I've talked to so many people who instead of reaching out, instead of being honest, instead of letting someone know that there's a real struggle going on in their life, they keep it to themselves because they're too embarrassed. It's too, too tender to let anybody else know what their struggle is. Dear friends, that doesn't work. When we think that people are too busy to be bothered, when we think that our problems are too embarrassing to be shared, all it does is play into the devil's hands. And let me tell you how the devil loves to work this program. He thrives on getting us all alone. He thrives on moving us into a place where we feel lonely, we feel isolated, we feel like there's nobody else and no one we can reach out to. Because when he has us in that place, he loves to wear us down and grind us down until we are broken. It is essential that we reach out, that we ask for help, that we let people know what's really happening in our lives. In fact, one of the things that I want to mention to you is if you're struggling, call the church office and let us know. We have a counseling department. We have a, a caring staff. In fact, one of the reasons that we've been making phone calls to our congregation is because we know how devastating and how difficult being alone and feeling lonely can be. We want to be there. We want to be a resource. We want to help. You know, one other thing I want to mention to you. It's not just a matter of reaching out if you're feeling lonely, having the courage and, and realizing that you are important enough, valuable enough to reach out and ask for help. But dear friends, if you know of someone who's lonely, if you know someone that's isolated, if, if God puts someone your, on your heart who maybe doesn't have anybody else around, you can reach out to them. You can be part of God's care and his compassion to reach out because here's the truth. Battling loneliness is everybody's job. We can all play a part. If I'm lonely, I can reach out for help. I can let somebody know. But if I'm not lonely, I can have my eyes open looking for people that I can reach out to and love. I can encourage as much as a text message or a phone call or maybe even a card. But you and I can help to battle loneliness by reaching out and seeking help. Point number two, loneliness can bring blessings. Now that's, a, that's tender to say, right? That's a hard kind of a thing. And I want you to listen to me because the fact is, like everything else, like God's promise in Romans 8, God can take something hard and turn it around into something incredibly helpful. When Jeremiah is complaining to God about his situation, in one particular passage, Jeremiah chapter 12, this is how God responds. 
If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you then compete with horses, right? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets? Now, when you hear that, what's it sound like God's saying? It sounds like God is, is giving tough talk to Jeremiah. It sounds like God is giving him a, a pep talk like a coach who's saying to one of his players, hey, man, toughen up. Stop whining. Stop complaining. Get strong. But that's not what God is saying. What God is really saying is that he's using the struggles and the loneliness and the pain in Jeremiah's life to help build him up, to make him stronger. And this is why that's so very important. You know, I remember years ago when I was a boy, I was the oldest in our family. I was probably a young teen. And I lived in Michigan, and, and it was in the late winter, early spring. And where we lived in Michigan, there was always usually a thaw. And I remember on this one particular winter, we'd had a ton of snow. But we'd had a, a, a melt, and so in the culvert that ran in front of our house. Now, this was a, a long driveway, and it came down to the place where our mailbox was, and the, we crossed over onto the main road, and there was this culvert that ran along this ditch, and it was filled with water. It wasn't just water, it was ice water. And I remember my siblings were, were all down there, and I don't remember why, I don't remember what happened, I'm sure we weren't supposed to be there, but we were all, all down in the same area, and they were playing around, because I remember at one point saying to, to my younger sisters and my brother, who's the youngest in the family, hey, stay away from the edge. You can look, but don't get close to the edge. Well, lo and behold, I had turned my back. My brother had gotten right up to the edge, and the snow gave way. And now he has fallen down into this icy water. It's freezing cold. And it's up to his shoulders. And my sisters are screaming and, and my, my brother can't get out. And I can see that he's getting cold. But before I could even get there, there was one of our neighbors who was not far away. And I remember he must have seen what was going on. Because he seemed to be there almost instantly. And I remember he reached down and he grabbed my brother by the back of his jacket. With one hand, he reached down and he pulled him out of the water. Wrapped his coat around him. So that he could get back up to the house and get warm. And I remember thinking, what a hero. He saved my brother. I mean, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know if I could have lifted him out on my own, but lo and behold, this man was there. And I thought to myself, man, I am so grateful for his strength. You know, one of the things that God does through pain and through struggle, through loneliness and hard times, is that he makes us stronger. And one of the things that may, God may be doing through these lonely times and these difficult experiences that you and I are having, he may be preparing us and making us stronger so that when we encounter someone who's slipping into loneliness, who's beginning to struggle desperately, we have the strength to reach down and pull them out. That's how God works. He uses people like us and he strengthens us to the point that he can use us in powerful ways. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes even just being single, unmarried, can make us feel lonely or alone. Paul says something interesting about that. Remember we talked about Paul early on. Paul never married. But he says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, I wish that all of you were as I am, meaning single. Paul's saying, you know, I wish you were exactly like me. Now, you and I might hear that and think, no, no, thank you, Paul. I don't want your life. I don't want your singleness. I don't want your persecution. I don't want your struggle. I don't want your beatings. And we certainly don't want your death. It was terrible. But Paul doesn't end with that statement, Paul goes on, and, and notice what he says in the second half of this verse. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. 
what I think is so fascinating is that, that Paul has learned to think beyond the struggle, to think beyond the pain, to think beyond loneliness, to realize that God gives us gifts and he intends to use those gifts, even if they don't feel like gifts, God intends to use the gifts that he gives us, the experiences that he leads us to, the strength that he builds in us to bless other people's lives. I mean, think of what he did with Paul. Paul was single, and I know he had to feel times of loneliness, but, but because he was single and alone, he had all kinds of time to do all kinds of travel, and in the process, he spread the gospel to the entire known world. God has this incredible way of taking our struggles and our pain, even loneliness, and turning it into something he can use in a powerful way to bless us and to bless our world. Dear friends, what's God doing with your struggles? What are you seeing? What are you sensing? What do you find that he's doing to work in your life? Because remember, even if you're feeling lonely, you're not actually alone. God is with you. God is with me. He's with all of us. And in a time like this, we need God's strength. In fact, I want you to read this next passage. This is from Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning at verse 7. Read these words with me. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green, and they never stop producing fruit. Dear friends, you and I can know, even when we don't feel it, even when loneliness is rearing its ugly head, you and I can know that we have the strength of the Lord, and because we have the strength of the Lord, we are not alone. So remember those first two points in dealing with loneliness. Number one, we must reach out. Number two, we've got to have in mind the truth that, that loneliness can bring blessings, even though it doesn't seem like it, and even though we might not choose it. But point number three, well, maybe you're saying, as I've been talking through this, that's well and good. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see God doing anything in my life. I don't see him using my struggle to produce strength. I don't see him working out something good from my loneliness. Maybe you're saying, hey, wait a minute. You're telling me I should reach out, but I have nobody, literally nobody that I can reach out to. What about me? What am I supposed to do? Well, I want to share with you something that, that may not seem intuitive. It may not be obvious, but I promise you, this is powerful. We've talked about it before. Point number three is that we must practice gratitude when you feel lonely and even when you don't. You know, the Bible is filled with exhortations to and expressions of gratitude to God. All kinds of different places, all throughout all of Scripture. And I've shared with you one particular verse many times. It's a verse from 1 Thessalonians, the last chapter of Paul's book to the, to the Thessalonians. And this is what it says, verse 16. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, in these short verses, God calls us to be joyful, prayerful, and thankful. But what's amazing is that he's not only inviting us, he tells us through the Apostle Paul that rejoicing, prayer, and gratitude are literally his will for our lives. What's that mean? Well, for this morning's purposes, I want to focus on two things. Number one, the reason that, that rejoicing and prayer and gratitude are God's will for our lives is because those three things are a choice that we make. 
a choice we make in the face of real life. They're not something that just happens automatically. They're not just our normal response to life. In other words, we must decide to be joyful. We must decide to be prayerful. We have to decide to give thanks. Those are choices we make, and we make those choices when it feels good, and we can make those choices when life doesn't feel so good. Joy, prayer, gratitude are a choice that we make. Second thing I want you to notice about 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18 is that each of these three activities, so rejoicing, prayer, and gratitude, they shift our focus from ourselves to God. In other words, when we, when we rejoice or when we pray or when we give thanks, it, it moves us from whatever it is we're feeling, whatever it is that may be weighing us down or causing us to struggle, and it causes us to come out of ourselves and focus on God. When we do that, everything changes. In fact, what I want to do is, is focus on just one of those three things, giving thanks. See, I'm convinced that one of the most powerful things that you and I can do in the midst of hard times, in the midst of real life struggles, is practice gratitude. You know, when we, when we practice gratitude, we think new thoughts. When we practice gratitude, we have different ideas. When we practice gratitude, our whole perspective changes, and we begin to see our lives the way God sees our lives. You know, if you are struggling because you can't think of a person to reach out to, stop. I mean, literally stop right now and begin to give thanks for everything in your life that you can possibly think of. Begin to make a list. If you want to be really effective, begin to write it down. Practice gratitude. If you're struggling with loneliness and you can't seem to see any way that God might be working to, to make you stronger, to build you up, to prepare you to help somebody else, stop. And begin to make a list of everything for which you are grateful. Because I promise you, God is going to use that gratitude in an extraordinary way to change your thinking or to open up your perspective or to remind you of the exact person to reach out to or of something that's happening that you never even thought of before. That's how powerful gratitude is. You know, when I think about that, I remember a time years ago when we were doing a mission trip in Costa Rica. And the place where we went in Costa Rica was, it was really remote. If those of you who were around at the time, you remember that we not only had to take a bus for several hours to almost to the, in fact, literally as we were taking the banana boat to the area where we were working, we crossed into Panama by, by the river. And so we, we went down, we were on this boat, we went on the bus, we, we traveled all the way back in, we had to hike a long way, and, and when we got in there, there was no running water. There were, let's just say it was as basic and as, it was a struggle. On top of that, it was really hot. It was 100 degrees every day, and the sun seemed to just beat down. It was like a, it was like a sledgehammer that seemed to just be pounding all day long. And one of the things that we were doing in this particular year is that we were helping to build a patio. So that meant that we would go down near the riverbank, we would gather sand or we would gather little rocks from different areas, and we would put them in these burlap sacks, and then we would put these sacks over our shoulder, and we would walk a quarter of a mile or so, back up, dump them, walk back down, fill our sack again. <laughs> I have to tell you, I remember... As I was making my millionth trip, it seemed, I was hot. I was sweaty. I, I, not only sweaty, but, you know, from putting this burlap sack with sand and little stones and gravel, I, I was all gritty and grimy. It was miserable. And I, I found myself just kind of becoming irritated. When one of, the, one of the folks, one of the ladies who was on the mission trip coming the other way said, Hey, Pastor. I'm thankful that I get to be in Costa Rica today. What she was saying to me, because we've been talking about it in our devotions, she was saying, I'm going to practice gratitude. And honestly, I didn't feel much like it, <laughs> truth be told. But I was trapped, right? I'd been talking about gratitude, and now one of my members is calling me out. She's being grateful. And so I said, I'm grateful for, I don't know what it was, something that I just thought of in the moment. 
And I went down and I, I got my next bag. And by the time I was coming back up to dump mine, she was coming back having dumped her bag of a sand or rocks. And, and as she passed me, she said, hey, pastor, I'm thankful that we're only an hour and a half away from lunch. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thankful that we have a, a filter so we can get fresh water. And we went on our way. We continued this game back and forth and back and forth. In fact, other people on the team going back and forth began to practice this. And you know what happened? Before long, I wasn't hot anymore. Before long, I wasn't feeling gritty and grimy. Before long, I was actually focused on being thankful. And the time flew by. Dear friends, I promise you, if you've never done this, trust me, practice gratitude because it changes everything. And what it changes first is our attitude. There's just one more thing. The most famous verse in all of Jeremiah is Jeremiah 29, 11. This is where God is speaking to his people. Now get this context. God is speaking to his people as they are going through a very, very hard time. They're afraid. They're upset. And they don't see any end in sight. And through the prophet Jeremiah, God says to his people, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You know, it makes me think about a, a time in my life a long, long time ago. It was my freshman year of college. It was actually before the freshman year began, and I was at the campus early for preseason football practice. And it was my goal to start in the backfield as a freshman. And I'd worked hard. I'd worked out all summer long. I'd trained all summer long. And, and, and I was working hard in the practices. And, you know, it didn't seem like anything was working. It didn't seem like I was making any progress. And I remember at the end of the practice, everybody was tired, especially me. And, and we were running wind sprints. And as we were, were running wind sprints, I was just getting more and more tired. And it was just one of those days I was getting more and more discouraged. And I, I, I was probably running slower and slower. I didn't really care about whether I was winning the, the wind sprint with my group or not. And, and at this one particular time, when we got to one of the ends of the field, the running back coach kind of walked by me. And as he walked by me, he said, you won't expect to keep the starting running back position if you practice like this. And I remember the spark that that ignited in my mind. I remember thinking, wait a minute, that sounds like maybe I have a chance. That, that sounds like maybe I have a chance to be the starter. And all of a sudden, all of that fatigue disappeared. All of a sudden, all of that struggle kind of melted away. And I was focused on winning every single wind sprint. It gave me renewed energy and it gave me renewed strength. And when you think about what, what God is saying to the people, what he's saying to the people in that time and what he's saying to us in Jeremiah 29, 11, it ought to help us to have that, that struggle and that pain, even loneliness, begin to melt away. Because what he's saying is there is incredible hope. There is amazing possibility. There is a wonderful future in store. Not because we know where we're going. Not because we've got it all together. Not because we can see the end of the, of the struggle. Because God promises it. You know, dear friends, I want you to realize something. If you're struggling with loneliness, it is not going to last forever. And know that even in the midst of that loneliness... You are not alone. The God who has a plan for you, the God whose plan for you is a good plan filled with hope and a wonderful future, that is the God who is always with us. You know, my hope, knowing that, gives you and me exactly the attitude adjustment we need. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And that your word not only tells of a time long ago, it speaks to people right now. People like our beloved family and me. 
Lord, use your word to strengthen us. In, in this time of struggle, in this time of loneliness, Lord, adjust our attitudes, lift our vision, and help us look to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into our COVID-19 exile and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.